Hi class, my name is Claudia Rattan. I'm a professor here in the Department of Entomology at University of Wisconsin. And I'm gonna tell you uh, a little bit today about arthropods and the role that they play in decomposition. And hopefully by the end of today, you'll have an appreciation for how these tiny little things that often go overlooked actually can play these really important roles in our soils and in our terrestrial ecosystems uh, in general. So I hope you enjoy it. Today, I'm gonna uh, talk about mesofauna and decomposition. And you're probably asking yourself, what in the world is he talking about? And why is he showing me a picture of elephant dung on the very first slide? Well, hopefully by the end of today, you'll understand what this is all about. Otherwise I will not have done my job correctly. What you're gonna learn about is about brown food webs. That is, all of the, that is all of the action that happens for all that plant material that actually is not eaten when it's alive. Most of the plant material, as you're gonna learn, actually hits the soil and fuels uh, an, an incredible diversity of organisms and interactions in the soil. And in order to understand this a little better, we're gonna delve into what decomposer food webs look like, what are some of the organisms that play important roles uh, in this, and what are the interactions that happen within the soils? We're gonna talk about what a food web is, basically who eats whom, the eaters and the eaten. And I'm gonna uh, talk about this concept of a trophic cascade, which is a really useful uh, uh, way to organize and try to understand the consequences of interactions between consumers, things that eat things, and their resources. And we're going to try to follow this, uh, this thread through from organisms that eat each other to the effects on plants as well. So from the dead food web, the brown food web, all the way into the green food web. That which you've spent a lot of time talking about in your class. And really, you know, the idea that the material flows of in ecosystems can actually be regulated by animals. All right, so let's go into this. So first I wanna start off by telling you a story. I love telling stories. This takes place in Australia. You can see here these cattle out in the outback of Australia. Cattle are not native to Australia. They were brought there um, in the 17, well, in the 1800s, actually, and ranching really took off. Now, one of the interesting things about these exotic animals in this particular landscape is that the they produce an incredible amount of feces. They eat up the grasses and shrubs and other things uh, that are there, which is why we raise them out in uh, in these uh, grasslands. And they produce these very juicy uh, pies of, uh, of feces, cow pies, as we call them. Now, in Australia, where these uh, large ungulates are not native to, most of the herbivory, uh, not most of the herbivory, but the herbivory that does take place is by a group of animals that actually produce feces much like this uh, over here, small little pellets. These are things by kangaroos, by wallabies, and so on that produce these very dried out little pellets. It's a very arid environment. So you can imagine that the organisms that might be able to process this feces are gonna be very different in Australia than in places where cattle were native to. And what happens, what happened in Australia was that these cow pies would just sit there and they would get infested by organisms that actually like dead and decaying, juicy things like these buffalo flies, as they were called, hematabia irritans. They're an incredible uh, pest of uh, cattle themselves. They will feed on them. Um, they, uh, they will blood feed uh, on them actually, and actually cause uh, economic uh, damage. The cows don't grow as well, they get sick, they're constantly uh, agitated and they don't spend as much time feeding. And so the cows suffer, uh, they, don't grow, uh, they don't grow as fast. And these buffalo flies um, are a major uh, economic pest. In fact, in uh, one of the provinces, in the uh, province of Queensland here, 
they basically were trying to raise money to uh, figure out ways to fund research um, uh, efforts to try to control this particular fly. Now the fly has this life cycle where it lays its eggs and the larvae develop in these juicy uh, dung pats, which is, um, uh, and then the flies actually emerge like, uh, like that. And the cycle repeats itself. So how to solve this problem of all this dung that doesn't get processed very readily. And when it does, and actually doesn't get processed very much, it generates these uh, pestiferous uh, flies. The agricultural research arm of the government, the CSIRO, uh, did a um, tried to solve this problem. And what they uh, thought was, well, maybe if we try to look at dung decomposition in places where the dung looks more similar to cattle, we might be able to learn something about how uh, we might be able to get rid of this wet, juicy dung faster so that these flies don't actually uh, have a chance to breed and cause these problems. Here's an example of places where there are similar types of ungulates. Um, this is the African savanna. You can see uh, zebras and uh, uh, wildebeest. I don't know my, uh, I don't know my animals uh, very well, uh, browsing on these incredible uh, grasslands that you've all been, uh, been learning about. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the other iconic organisms here is the elephant. And that's why I started this, uh, the very first uh, image that I showed you uh, was, uh, was that. And elephants can produce uh, an incredible amount of tonnage of, uh, of, of waste. Now, what's interesting here, and one of the take home messages that I want you to remember uh, about today is that although that live, green plant material has certain nutritional uh, qualities that are good for, uh, for certain organisms like ungulates, like cows, like elephants. We eat uh, plant material directly. There's still a lot of really uh, good energy and nutrients trapped within this material that has passed through the animals. And so this is a potential resource. This is food that these uh, that other organisms might be able to take advantage of. And in fact, through, uh, through uh, millions of years of evolution, there are a, a plethora of organisms that actually make a living within this dead and decaying uh, material. Here's an example of some of the champions of, uh, of this uh, lifestyle. Check out this video with uh, one of my favorites, uh, David, Attenborough, uh, David Attenborough. True to their name, dung beetles depend entirely on dung for food and moisture and to cater for their offspring. It's highly nutritious stuff, the fresher the better. But the beetles need to work fast. They've only got three months to pack in the calories before the migrant herds move on again. Millions of dung beetles from over a hundred different species provide a highly efficient waste disposal service. A single dung pat can vanish without trace in less than 10 minutes. Without this help from dung beetles, the daily dose of 5,000 tons would soon swamp the plains. Each type of beetle is encoded with a special blueprint for dealing with dung. Some just eat as quickly as they can. Others bury their share beneath the pat. Being a special agent, Caper has a much more sophisticated approach. His head chisel carves out the dung. Leg rakers neatly shape it into a ball. It's the perfect takeaway. But a ready-made package like this attracts double agents. Agents come well trained in martial arts. The versatile front limbs become crucial weapons in unarmed combat. A firm grip under the assailant and a neat judo throw does the trick. 
You've got to be on the ball to get the advantage. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I uh, enjoyed watching it. I think the sound effects are awesome. I am sure that that's really what dung beetles sound like uh, when you get right down close to them. Well, in fact, dung beetles were, uh, which is a group of, um, of beetles, uh, scarabs, was, uh, dung beetles are the organisms that uh, the Australian researchers found and brought back to Australia to help with this uh, dung accumulation uh, problem. In fact, from uh, 1969 to the 90s, over 53 species of dung beetles were brought into Australia. 23 of them uh, had established, and each of them has a slightly different lifestyle that makes them more effective under different environments. Some of them like it in uh, colder or wetter uh, uh, environments. Some of them do better in the hotter, uh, drier inland regions. And that's why uh, this, um, uh, this range of organisms was actually needed. And for the most part, they did an incredible job at the dung, the dung decomposition, the dung breakdown. Much of them uh, did this, uh, the, the ball rolling like you saw in the, uh, in the BBC uh, video. So let's, uh, um, let's explore this uh, a little bit more. So I wanna go into this topic of how arthropods, how these joint-legged exoskeleton-laden uh, organisms are, uh, play roles in moving carbon and nutrients through ecosystems. The plants accumulate, uh, the biomass, they fix the carbon, they grab nitrogen from the environment, but a lot of it actually doesn't get eaten by other organisms like herbivores that eat that green plant material. Here I'm showing a, uh, a salt marsh in the mid-Atlantic uh, states uh, of uh, the US. This was actually in New Jersey where I used to do some of my work. And what you see here is an incredible grassland it's a grassland that's a little unusual in that it grows in wet inundated uh, areas. It's a single species, Spartina alterniflora, and uh, it forms almost uh, complete monocultures. This is very rare actually in nature that we see monocultures uh, in, uh, in natural environments, but these environments are very harsh and it's very hard for other plants to, to grow there. There's a few other species that know how to deal with that salinity of the seawater kind of coming in and, and out. There's some of the most productive uh, um, ecosystems in the world actually on a per meter squared basis. Now, the interesting thing about these uh, particular ecosystems is that they produce all of this biomass and they were, uh, the focus of study for a long period of time. In fact, some of the early beginnings of the field of ecology was around this question of uh, how do ecosystems work? How do, how do natural uh, systems capture the energy of the sun? And, and how is that energy then used by different uh, groups, different, um, uh, different consumers in the, in the ecosystem? And what uh, this study here by John Thiel uh, showed, he's showing here the partitioning of energy. Uh, these, this is in, uh, in joules actually, in, uh, kilo, uh, in kilocalories. Most of the energy coming from the sun is, goes through this compartment here, uh, through the Spartina compartment. This is the green carbon di the green photosynthesis and fixation and capture uh, of that energy. Not all of that energy is captured. There's actually some, some waste. Uh, photosynthesis is not very uh, efficient. Uh, some of that energy is immediately respired off as the plants maintain themselves. And whatever's left over becomes available for herbivores. Now, what should immediately jump out at you in this is that this pipeline from the green plant material to the herbivores, which are mostly insects, is actually kind of small, you know? And then these insects here, little plant hoppers and other leaf uh, feeding insects become food for other things like spiders. And I actually spent most of my uh, early career trying to study this particular interaction here. But what you should see is that of this green stuff here, these are the photosynthesizers. Well, here's another group of photosynthesizers, uh, algae. Most of this green stuff actually goes unutilized. It just 
it senesces. You know, the plant grows, it builds its tissues. When it's done, at the end of the season, it pulls uh, those uh, nutrients back into the roots. The above ground material dies, not being eaten by anything and falls into this channel here. This is still good material that for certain organisms can be a resource, can be food. So what happens to that where the large majority, you know, falls uneaten? Here's an example of that leftover. This is the Spartina grass right here. And here's the leftover stalks or stems and leaves from the previous year's growth that had just senesced. There's actually energy still trapped in those if you know how to get at it. And that's what decomposers uh, will actually do is work on this dead material. So here's plants again. Here's the herbivores that feed on the live plant material. And here's the predators that feed on these herbivores. So this is the above ground green food web. And here's the food web that is then driven by this dead material here, which is fueled by this group of consumers. Yes, they're consumers also, but they, they feed on this dead material here. So what is it? What is this group and how does it work? That's what we're gonna talk about next. Oh yeah, of course, some of these herbivores actually die and get eaten by the decomposers as well. So when you look at the soil biota, the organisms, the life that's in the soil at that surface where that leaf material or that dung for that matter falls and lands on the surface, it's inhabited by a range of organisms. And here along the x-axis is, is just a scale of body size and it's log two units. And this is kind of a, just a, simplest, a simple way of showing things that vary widely in their body size here with bacteria on the very far end over here, you know, microscopic one um, uh, micrometer in size, two things like fungi, which are a little bit bigger, nematodes, protozoans, we often refer to this as the microflora and the microfauna right here. Things like protozoans and uh, uh, rotifers uh, are uh, the or some of the organisms that will feed on the flora, which are these guys here. Once you get above 100 uh, microns, this is 0.1 millimeter, meter, millimeters, you start into this category, which is kind of arbitrarily defined as the mesofauna, mites, Columbula, and some of these guys. And I'll show you some images of those. And then when you're above two millimeters here, well, now you're in the macrofauna and the megafauna. You know, megafauna, if you're greater than two, uh, two centimeters in, uh, uh, in length. And now we've got things like uh, spiders and millipedes and uh, beetles and so on. So we're, when we're talking about megafauna here, this is still pretty small. You know, we're going from you know, the mesofauna of 0.1 millimeter to something that is 20 millimeters. So these are, these are still tiny little organisms. And all of these have a role to play in processing that detritus, that dead material. So here's some examples. Um, so here we've got things like uh, millipedes or isopods. Um, I'm sorry, here we have things like uh, millipedes here we have isopods. You often uh, probably played around with these as a kid. We call them roly polies. Um, these are mites and columbola. Here's the mites up on the top here and columbola, very diverse uh, group, highly uh, uh, speciose. The orobatid mites in particular are some of those primary decomposers that actually feed on fragmented litter and uh, microbial residues. As you get, into some of the bigger uh, mesofauna, things like spiders, uh, centipedes here, pseudoscorpions, they're not really scorpions, a different group of mites, the gamacid uh, mites, staphylinids, and so on. These often are predators on these primary uh, and secondary uh, decomposers. So while these are processing and feeding on the litter directly or on the microbes and the fungi that are feeding on the litter. These groups here are feeding on the decomposers uh, themselves. Here's one, um, 
way that we could wire these interactions, just the connections, the interconnections between the different resources and their consumers in an area. You can start over here with the detritus. The detritus is often uh, categorized into labile detritus, things that is, that is easy to decompose, uh, has a low C to N ratio, lots of nitrogen uh, relative uh, to carbon. Bacteria are thought to be some of the first things that can get their little um, enzymes and slurp up uh, these kinds of uh, org um, materials here. On the other hand, detritus also includes things that are resistant or recalcitrant. They don't break down uh, very easily. These are complex carbon molecules, things like cellulose or lignin that are bound together very tightly. And a different group of organisms, the fungi in particular, have uh, the capacity to, uh, to break those down. They actually uh, have um, enzymes that are special uh, and specific to these really recalcitrant and hard to break uh, carbon and carbon nitrogen uh, bonds here. So often we, we kind of have this range or this gradient of labile to resistant uh, detritus with the fungi being more um, uh, likely uh, primary decomposers of this uh, resistant and the bacteria more of the decomposers of that labile uh, carbon. And then there's a group of organisms like nematodes, mites, calimbola that feed on the fungi. Um, microbes initially are either fed upon by certain kinds of mites that just slurp up the, uh, the, bacterial, uh, the bacterial films that exist there. There are some nematodes that are also specialized um, on, uh, on bacteria. And then you can go to kind of a higher trophic level. We can think of these as feeding levels uh, almost, where there's predatory nematodes, predatory mites, predatory columbola that will feed on these um, these secondary uh, decomposers uh, here. Now, obviously, the, um, the roots themselves of the plants will die uh, and uh, contribute to this, uh, to this pool of uh, detritus, as will the, um, the leaf material uh, also. So this looks complicated, but when you start to break it down, it's really not that bad. In fact, you can kind of summarize it to look something like this, where plant residues, or uh, detritus uh, found in other ways, um, generated uh, in, in other ways, fuels fungi and bacteria, is sometimes fed upon by these primary decomposers uh, themselves, columbola, mites to some extent, earthworms, I'm not, in, uh, we, we should include those because the uh, earthworms actually will feed on this directly. In the process, um, I'm sorry, and then there are these secondary decomposers that will feed both on fungi and bacteria as well as on the detritus. So things like uh, columbola might not only be feeding on, um, on the plant material itself, but they might actually be incidentally slurping up some of these uh, fungi and bacteria, or, or maybe even preferentially feeding on the fungi and bacteria. And here you have these predators that, that look like this. So this is the beginning of a food web which is really, as I said, the interactions between a resource and a consumer. It's about who eats whom or who eats what. Fungi feeding on plants, columbola feeding on fungi, consumer, resource, consumer, resource. And as you start putting these together, you can come up with networks. And when you have networks, then really cool things start to happen. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a simple way uh, to, to think about these networks. Here's an example of fungi feeding on detritus. What you're seeing here, the mushrooms, the mushroom um, uh, that you see here, these are the reproductive structures of the mushrooms that actually produce the spores, which are the sexual forms that uh, then colonize uh, new environments. But most of the business of these mushrooms is actually happening as part uh, uh, inside of this detritus, as part of this network of hyphae of these tentacles almost of, uh, of the mushrooms that are going around and scavenging for nutrients and breaking down that, that material, which then fuels their growth and their reproduction. 
So what I'm going to do next and is share two stories uh, with you about decomposition of dead plant material and how organisms regulate, regulate that decomposition. And in the second example, I'm going to make that and in the second example, I'm also gonna be able to tie that back to how this affects plants and plant production. Now, the first example I'm gonna use here is from a colleague of mine, uh, Professor David Wise, now at the University of uh, Chicago. Uh, I'm sorry. The first example I'm gonna give you here is from a colleague of mine, uh, Dave Wise, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And it doesn't have to do with grasslands, so apologies, but it's, to me, one of the cleanest and easiest ways to kind of understand the, how interactions between this, these mesofauna affect this accumulation of material at the soil uh, surface. This has to do with some of the work he did in deciduous forests in uh, Kentucky at the time. And just like is happening right now in the fall, most of the leaves are not eaten by herbivores. There's a lot of green material there. It lands on the, on the forest floor and something happens to it. It starts to break down. Otherwise, Year after year, that material, if it didn't break down, would pile up and nothing would grow there. We wouldn't be able to walk through the forest. So clearly something is processing that, uh, that material. Forest floors are an incredibly diverse uh, environment. Lots of organisms are uh, present there, starting here from the bottom. Things again, like our sweet little columbula here, the springtails that are detritus and, um, and fungal feeders, mites. There's a variety of uh, flies that feed on decomposing material, fungi. It's hard to come up with nice, nice pictures of, um, uh, of microbes feeding on the, uh, on, the, on the leaf litter here, pseudoscorpions, centipedes. This is not a very good picture, but this is a spider, a wolf spider here with an egg sac right here. And you can all go all the way up to salamanders and little um, shrews and other things. And what this represents really is a network of interactions between resources and their consumers. The resource of fungi and litter is fed upon by things like columbula, flies, crickets, this resource here of these decomposers is fed upon thing, by things like centipedes, spiders, and ants. And these in turn are also fed upon by higher level consumers. Again, that food web. Now in the, the uh, forest system, um, what, uh, what uh, Wise did was he focused on this particular set of interactors, fungi and the litter, the columbula, and the spiders. These were numerically some of the most abundant uh, organisms uh, that were there. And he thought that understanding the, uh, the interactions between these could shed some light on understanding on how litter gets uh, processed. So if we simplify this food web into something that looks like a food chain, you might draw it to be to look something like this, where the resources at the bottom are things like the fungi and the litter, these are fed upon by the columbula, by the springtail, that tiny little mesofauna. And the spiders are hunters and they're obligate carnivores and they only feed on soft bodied uh, things that are smaller than them like these columbula. And so here's the simplified food web into a food chain. Now, rather than showing energy flow, we can also show the degree of interaction uh, between these. So what would you expect the consequences of columbula feeding on those resources to have for the rate of decomposition? So columbula are feeding on this resource here. What might you think it would do to the rate of decomposition? Well, the more the columbula are processing and getting rid of that biomass of litter, that means the rate of decomposition is going faster. Okay, so it's not the biomass that matters here. It's having a negative effect on the biomass, but the rate of disappearance of that biomass is going up when columbula are around. We can ask a similar question. What do you think would happen when there's spiders around? 
to columbola. Well, spiders are predators. They should have a negative effect on columbola. Now, if you take these three, these two interactions together across these three trophic levels, what do you think the relationship is between spiders and the rate of decomposition? If columbola have a positive effect on the rate of decomposition and spiders have a negative effect on columbola, then you might predict that there should be an indirect relationship between spiders and the rate of decomposition. And that rate of, and that the, the directionality of that should be negative because if spiders are eating the columbola, there's fewer columbola to eat the litter and therefore litter should be sticking around longer. And what that means is the rate of decomposition goes down. So spiders are expected to have a negative effect on the rate of decomposition. This indirect effect of one trophic level here, the third trophic level on a non-adjacent trophic level, this is this rate of decomposition, or at least this process here, we refer to as a trophic cascade. Trophic meaning feeding, and it cascades because it kind of falls down you know, through this system. So the effect of spiders should be felt all the way down to the amount of litter that's there, and therefore the rate of the decomposition. That's what a trophic cascade refers to. Now, this concept of the trophic cascade was actually first investigated and uh, explored in aquatic systems, looking at the effect of fish on algae and whether uh, fish on uh, plank zooplankton and the zooplankton on the phytoplankton and what that does to the clarity of lakes. So this is a very broad concept. People have looked at it in uh, above ground systems. And now we've started looking at it in these below ground systems uh, as well. So the real question is, is this true? You know, we know that columbola affect the rate of decomposition. What happens, uh, is this true that spiders could have this negative an indirect effect on the rate of decomposition through their action on the columbola. So who are these spiders? Well, again, very diverse on the forest floors. They include a variety of uh, web building spiders uh, like these, the linifeids are probably the most uh, common here. You're probably familiar with uh, things like um, uh, black widow spiders, agilenids. These are uh, fantastic uh, spiders as well as the wanderers. These are the ones that are actually hunting. They move around the forest floor like the wolf spiders uh, here, these nephosids here. They cruise around. Salticids are just amazing. They have got these big uh, googly eyes in, uh, in the front. Um, they they uh, move around and either hunt their prey or they sit and wait until something goes in front of them and then they jump on it. They're ambush uh, predators. But either way, they, are, they don't set up webs to capture uh, things. And so in this particular system, uh, Wise uh, said that, uh, was curious about the effect of these wandering uh, groups of, of spiders because columbola are relatively sedentary and they're unlikely to get caught up in the webs of, uh, of um, web building uh, spiders. So it's probably the wanderers that are gonna be the ones that are picking off the, the columbola. So he did this really clever uh, experiment and you can see the citation uh, below, but basically he created these uh, in um, these little mesocosms where he put down these baffles in a, in a forest floor and the baffles were meant to prevent the movement in and out of these uh, arenas of uh, spiders. Some of them, um, he actually removed the spiders from them, he went through and actually sifted all of that litter and plucked out all of the spiders and everything that wasn't a spider, he put back in. Others, he didn't do anything. They're just controls. And then he also had a reference plot way over here where he didn't put in the, um, the baffles uh, at all, just in case the partitions here themselves may have had some effect on the, um, uh, on the interactions uh, as well. So what did he find? Well, he found here uh, is a time along the uh, x-axis. 
and he was interested in the effects of the spider removals on the columbula, and in particular, these tomocerid columbula, which were the most abundant and most common ones here. So this is the uh, amount of columbula that were there. And uh, what you can see here is when the spiders were removed, that there generally were higher densities of the columbula than when the spiders were left alone or when they were compared to those plots that were outside of the, uh, of the, the squares that he had set up. So this difference here is, he inferred, was the effect of predation of the spiders on the columbula. So clearly spiders are having an effect on the abundance of these columbula. So check, you know, this uh, interaction actually is occurring. When there's spiders around, particularly these wanderers, columbula are less common. So now we at least have the setup of exploring what happens all the way down to litter disappearance. So this again is the hypothesis uh, that we're curious about. So then Wise did another study with his uh, student, uh, Kendra Lawrence, uh, here. They set up a very similar experiment here. You can see the baffles uh, right here. You can see these lips around the baffles that prevents the spiders from crawling in and out of it. They, they're not good at hanging upside down. So that's kind of a clever uh, little design. He set up a series of open plots here that didn't have any baffles. Oops. He had the fenced plots just like he did before, where he just put them in. That's what, that was like the controls. He had some that he fenced and he sifted everything and then he put everything right back. So that was like a disturbance, you know, just in case the sifting uh, had any effect. And then he had the ones where he sifted it and he plucked out all of the spiders. So what did he find? Well, what he found was that in the treatments where there was the removal, the fencing, the sifting, and the removal, there was a much lower density of spiders than when there was only a fence and the sifting. So they were able to drop the population of spiders by about, the, of wandering spiders, by about 66%. Uh, percent. And they also were able, uh, they also um, uh, plucked out some of the, the weavers there as well. But again, they didn't think that the weavers were really the ones that were playing that big of a role, but they cut their populations in about half inside of these. And these were significant uh, effects. So what happened to the columbula? Very similar, they, uh, sift, they sampled uh, the columbula. I won't go into detail of, of how they did that, but what they found was that compared to the open plots or the fenced plots where the spiders were maintained, when the spiders were removed, the columbal populations increased. So that again was evidence to them that removal of the spiders compared to situations when spiders were around increases uh, columbal density because you're relieving the predation that is actually happening on those, um, uh, on those columbula. So the removal gets rid of the spiders and the columbula bounce back. So then what they did is inside of each one of these enclosures, they placed a series of uh, lit either litter bags like this, which are small little bags with holes in them that allow the columbula to get in and out, or they actually uh, weighed and labeled uh, some leaves that they put uh, on the um, uh, right at the soil surface. And these litter bags actually had a, a weighed out amount of litter that was inside of them. And then what they could do is they could go back at a certain time later and see how much litter had disappeared under each one of those environments, an environment with spiders, an environment without spiders. And what do they find? There, so there's the, that's the open leaf container and that's the uh, litter bag uh, experiment. And what they found was very similar to the pattern that they saw with the columbula, that in the presence of spiders, the loss of litter was about, oh, I don't know, is about 18%, something like this. But when you remove spiders, the litter disappearance went up. And remember, these were the plots where the columbula were more abundant. So this is one of the first demonstrations, experimental demonstrations, that even in a brown food web, 
that the presence of a predator has an effect on an ecosystem process, an ecosystem rate here, which is litter disappearance. So these are not interactions that are only restricted to the living world, but they also occur in the brown food webs uh, as well. And remember the definition of a trophic cascade here is that the effect of these predators, the spiders, through this intermediary, the columbola, has an effect on an ecosystem rate or, um, or abundance of, of litter uh, there. So it's this non, this cascading effect, this non-adjacent trophic level uh, effect. All right, so let me give you the last example uh, here that kind of illustrates this idea of how organisms can mediate decomposition and the processing of material and the movement of nutrients and carbon within these brown uh, food webs. And this one actually does have to do uh, with grasslands um, in the uh, Himalayas. Uh, and it's a story about, you got it, dung. Uh, dung produced by yaks, Bos grunians, um, which is uh, uh, an important um, domesticated animal, uh, livestock species used by the local people in the Himalayas. And uh, I did not know this, but yak apparently produces a lot of dung paths uh, per uh, hectare with as much as 24% of the grassland actually covered uh, with, uh, with dung in some capacity over the summer grazing uh, pastures. The study that I'm going to refer to is uh, uh, shown uh, here at the bottom. And what the researchers uh, were doing here is they wanted to understand how the interactions between this dung beetle here, a photius, the adult, and the larva, remember the larva is the one that actually feeds uh, in the dung uh, primarily, and these two different rove beetles, these are predators. So just like the previous uh, example, you know, here's the coprophagus, meaning feces eating beetle here. The dung beetle feeds on the young, uh, on the yak dung here. And the yak dung, through its processing and decomposition, liberates nutrients, which then become available for the vegetation. And their question was, is the presence and the activity of these two predatory beetles, a, a small one and a large one, have an effect on this processing of dung through this trophic cascade uh, mechanism that I had already introduced. So if you actually look at that, so what they did is an experiment where they scooped up and created their own uh, standardized yak pies. How'd you like to have that for a job? And and then what they did is they placed them out in the environment, allowed them to get colonized by the dung beetles, and then either excluded or included the predatory beetles in combination. They only they either allowed no predators to get in by creating a little cage around this dung pie. They either put only the small one in there, the big one in there, or the both of them uh, in there. So here's what they found. What they found is that at the beginning of decomposition, over here on this side, a lot of dung beetles make it into these dung pa uh, pies here. And as the dung ages, fewer and fewer beetles are present, but more and more dung disappears uh, here. This is dung loss, which is basically how, how much is gone. You know, So as you move up this axis, you could think of this as decomposition rate. Um, as you move up this axis, you could think of it as, uh, you know, how much is left over. Less and less is, is left over. And the dung is aging here. And there's fewer and fewer beetles because beetles are maturing, maybe they're dying, maybe they're, um, there's just less material there uh, to, to feed on. It's an example of what the dung beetles are actually doing to those dung pies. Along the x-axis here is what happens to a variety of uh, processes here as the dung disappears. Actually, as what happens 
to plant biomass, soil phosphorus concentration, and the uh, soil nitrogen uh, content when different amounts of dung have been lost from these uh, dung pies. And what they found was a consistent and positive relationship between losing dung and plant growth. So the more dung is taken away, the more plants that are growing, these are grasses that are growing in and around that dung, the more they're actually able to grow. The more soil phosphorus is available and the more soil nitrogen is available. So this is the idea that through the processing and the breakdown and the, uh, the, uh, the decomposition of those complex organic molecules that are part of that, uh, of that dung, that nutrients are liberated, nitrogen and phosphorus primarily, but there's other things as well. And plants are able to take those up and, uh, and grow. So there's a positive effect of decomposition on plant growth. So then they did this experiment where they either had the dung beetles with either no predators here, small predators only, I'm sorry. Then they did this experiment where they either, they allowed the, the cow pie, the yak pies to get uh, colonized and they excluded all the predators. And they looked at how, how much plants grew, how much dung was lost, what the soil nitrogen uh, content was and what the soil phosphorus content was. And so here's what it is when you only have dung beetles. When you introduce the small predatory beetles, what you can see here is that less dung is consumed here because now there's a predator and those predators are feeding on the dung beetles. And there seems to be a small decrease here in how much plants can grow. And it looks like there's kind of a, a slight dip in the amount of soil nitrogen and uh, you know a dip here also in the amount of soil phosphorus uh, that's there. If you add the large predators, it looks like the large predators might be a little more effective at depressing the, uh, the dung loss. Maybe they're just more voracious and they eat more of the dung beetles. It looks like soil nitrogen goes down even further. Soil phosphorus goes down even further. And now plant biomass is definitely lower. This is significantly lower than, than this. Man, it looks like it's almost, you know, 10% or, you know, some, something like that. And then if you let both of them uh, in there, both predators in there, it looks like it doesn't really get you that much more than having the two individual uh, predators by themselves. I'm gonna let you think about that a little bit. Like why would you not have twice the effect when you've got two different predators in there at the same density, I have to add, you know, why do you not get an enhanced effect uh, there? Nevertheless, what you have here is in the presence of predators here, you have less dung disappearing which liberates less nutrients in the soil and plants don't grow as much. And so their conclusion here is that just like with the, with the forest example that I showed earlier, that through the predation on those decomposing beetles, there is more dung around. And when there's more dung around, there's less nutrients around and vegetation does not grow as much. And therefore there's a negative and indirect effect of these predators on vegetation. There's more dung around, less decomposition, which is consistent with the wise example in the forest. And they were able to take it to the next step of seeing how that affects plant growth. Because presumably if nutrients are getting mobilized during that decomposition process, plants should be able to, to take advantage of it. And in fact, that's, that's what happens. But when there's predators around, the plants don't do uh, as well. So let me just summarize here uh, what we've learned today. So into the soil system, there is a variety of organic material that makes it in there. Some of it comes from the above ground parts, plants die, or they are broken off, or they just senesce and they land on the soil surface. Some of it actually comes from below ground. The roots senesce, they break off, 
they are uh, sloughed off uh, by the plants. The plants turn over uh, their roots. So there's an input of organic material, both from this above ground part and this below ground part. And there's a range of organisms that vary in species composition, in their richness, these little things that we refer to as the mesofauna, above and beyond the microbes, the, uh, the fungi and the bacteria that are processing uh, the, the, that litter directly. There's a range of these organisms that are also involved in regulating the fluxes of those organic uh, uh, and uh, of those organic materials in the soils. And of course, we can make this more complex by looking at how the above ground environment might affect this. Things like, you know, the, the micro, macro climates and carbon dioxide concentrations, as well as land use change. All of these affect how plants grow. All of these affect how, um, how habitats are structured. They may have a direct effect on the organisms uh, there as well. And of course, you can throw in things like, uh, like large animals, uh, like ungulates, uh, browsers here, uh, grazers that we either manage or that occur naturally, which could also be affecting the amount of organic matter input and the habitat uh, structure that's there. So this is kind of a broader, uh, kind of zooming out a little bit. So here's some take home concepts uh, for today, just to wrap things up. And if there's anything I want you to remember, and that is that the dead don't die. That even though that plant material is no longer living, when it either goes through the bowels of a, the, the digestive tract of, a, of an herbivore and ends up on the soil surface or just sloughs off of the, of the plants. In fact, most of the biomass of plants never goes through an herbivore, it just senesces there. That material there is still rich with energy and nutrients. And there's a whole suite of organisms that have figured out how to crack that nut and make a living off of that, uh, off of that material. And this is what we refer to as brown food webs. So a lot of plant material hits the soil that's dead. And these decomposer food webs process this material. And I introduced this concept of the food web, which is basically a fancy way of trying to figure out who eats who the eaters and the eaten, the consumers and the resource there. And the potential for these non, uh, and the potential for these indirect interactions through a food web that reticulate through these intermediate uh, players. So predators by eating, herb, uh, by eating decomposers can affect the amount of detritus that is there and therefore the decomposition rate through these indirect uh, effects. And that as a consequence, the flow of materials and nutrients of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus through these ecosystems can be regulated by animals. And this has an effect for the above ground uh, growth of plants uh, as well. I hope this has been useful. I hope it helps uh, tie together uh, a couple of the concepts. Um, if you wanna learn about more about dung beetles, Stick around and watch the video that follows this. Other than that, thank you very much. If you have any questions, here's my email. Take care. Here are true facts about the dung beetle. The dung beetle survives mainly or solely by eating the feces of other animals. That's terrifying. Wait, that's a typo. It eats the feces of other animals. Well, that's even worse. The rolling dung beetle finds dung with its acute sense of smell. The dung beetle then selects a choice piece to roll into a bowl. Oh, that's disgusting. Cut it. Cut the clip. I told you I won't. I'm not going to narrate the footage of poop. It's just not going to happen. This isn't better. This has nothing to do with the dung beetle. Fine. The female dung beetles then judge their potential mates by the size of their balls. Oh, come on, that's a lynx. Wait, why is he stalking that Santa baby? Run away, Santa baby. After a mating pair is established, the female often attaches herself to the dung ball chariot, and the male rolls them away from the dung pile. He does this backwards by pushing on the ball with his hind legs. Imagine getting into a car and putting your head face down on the seat, and then steering with your butt. That is how the dung beetle do. Needless to say, they get lost from time to time. 
When it strays off course, the dung beetle climbs on top of its ball and uses the position of the sun, the moon, and even the Milky Way to reorient itself. Sort of like how ancient sailors once did, except without the giant ball of shit. Here, a scientist uses a mirror to confuse the hell out of a dung beetle. Along the way, he must face challengers who seek to claim his turd ball, the ensuing battle sometimes lasting for hours. When they have finally completed their journey, the young freaky couple digs a small hole in the soft sand. The female then lays her eggs inside the dung ball and then seals them up using more dung, her saliva, and her own feces, just for good measure. <laughs> and then when the baby is born, it eats its way out. <laughs> the circle of life. Just remember, no matter how bad your job is, even if you shovel crap for a living, at least you're not doing it naked and with your mouth and then eating it.